Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Good morning to everyone. Uh, especially want to thank Dr. Jacob for setting me up as the patsy for this debate. So kudos to you. The, uh, it's great fun, but I look forward to uh, having a spirited debate. Um, if I can get this to work, that would be great. Is it the green button, green arrow, or is it the, there we go. All right, so then my disclosures for seven seconds, if we're so inclined, despite this not being a non-CME. But let me start by asking, um, I know this is a highly curated audience with the IHC, but how many of you are not comfortable doing an open Lichtenstein repair? Don't be bashful. Okay, just, setting, just, just for the record, so I understand where, where we all stand with this. So we're gonna talk a little bit about prostatectomy, what that does for inguinal hernia repair, talk about the role of open and robotic repair, a little bit about the safety, cost, financial reimbursement associated with it, and hopefully uh, convince you that an open repair in that situation makes the most sense. Now, I would, I would be remiss if I didn't talk to you about my esteemed um, co-debater, um, Caleb Blake. I mean, she's well pedigreed from Dallas, Southwestern, uh, fellowships in Dartmouth, at Cleveland. You know, we're in the motherland right now, so highly trained, highly regarded um, and being in Cleveland, just keep in mind, you know, this is the home of the Cleveland mob, right? But sometimes the soldiers go astray. And um, I just want to make sure that everyone realizes that, you know, great, great things sometimes do fall. So, Kayla, good luck to you. <laughs> so, in the era of prostatectomy, um, about 90,000 people undergo prostatectomy today each and every year. It's the second most common cancer that we see in men. Um, one in eight men are diagnosed, and depending on the methodology in which prostatectomy is performed, the incidence of inguinal hernia is actually increased. So um, we see it far more commonly in elderly patients, and we also see it far more commonly following the open prostatectomy. So keep that in mind as well, although the operation following a, a, a robotic retropubic uh, prostatectomy may be more feasible doing it lap doing a robotically laparoscopically when the inguinal hernia develops many of these are following the open prostatectomy so this is not a one size fits all sort of proposition um, as we move through this um, and I had the opportunity to have dinner with Flavio Malcher last night and you're going to hear a lot of great data from Flavio but to quote Flavio he said man 15 minutes into these cases I'm usually asking myself what am I doing here so how many of you in the room in this curated audience feel that an opening or hernia repair is the best approach post prostatectomy? So it's, it's mixed. I mean, we got, we got a bunch. Um, and the bottom line is um, it's not entirely certain. You know, so is there agreement? Absolutely not. Is there certainty? The answer, the answer is absolutely not. And, you know, so I would argue it's probably not chaotic, but at the very best, it's complex. And considering this, I think, is really important. I analogize this a little bit to going swimming. I love the ocean. I'm a beach guy, love going. But as soon as I see a shark in the water, I'm out. Um, and if the shark gets real closely, close to me, I'm thinking, why didn't I just go to the pool, right? I'm not gonna throw my kid into the water. And that's a little bit about what it's like doing a prostatectomy after, excuse me, doing an inguinal hernia repair robotically or laparoscopically after a, uh, after a prostatectomy. We know there's a learning curve. Every operation has a learning curve. Well, if we're gonna do this robotically, we have to overcome the robotic learning curve, and we also have to overcome the inguinal hernia learning curve. And it's not just the inguinal hernia learning curve, it's the inguinal hernia curve in a reoperative field uh, with the challenges associated with the peritoneum plaster to the um, plaster to the iliac vessels, sometimes resection of the peritoneum, which really adds to the complexity. And in fact, the American Board of Surgery has described robotic surgery as the Wild West. Right? There's, there's no defined training for this. Like, they can't get their hands around it. Not every institution has a robot, so how do we do this? It's been left to the hands of institutions and the companies that manufacture the robots. It's, it's incredible, really, that we sit here in 2024 and that we have not been able to figure out how to adequately train people. When we look at the outcomes associated with robotic inguinal hernia repair, it's no better than laparoscopic repair. Um, the outcomes are exactly the same, but it takes longer. It costs more money. This is data that Kayla Blake was involved in the creation of. Um, so she, she's well versed in this and she knows it's expensive and time consuming. So, you know, why would you do it? And in fact, meta-analyses have confirmed this. It, it's no better than a laparoscopic repair. Um, 
and it's just more timely and costly. But I'll concede there, there's some advantages, but the question is who are the advantages to? You know, surgeons love the 3D visualization. They love the control of all the ports. You don't have to yell at, an at, a, at a camera driver. It's comfortable, we're sitting while we're operating. The added degrees of freedom are, are phenomenal. But obviously the drawbacks, as we mentioned, availability, um, not every institution has a robot and certainly not a robot in every room. There's the cost, the, the staff, maybe that's an advantage or a disadvantage. Um, not needing as many staff, but the staff that you need are, are gonna be um, more highly trained and, Obviously, there's device and procedural learning curves. And I would argue the reason the robotic hernia repair has taken off is because lapping little hernia repair is challenging, right? The TEP, learning those planes is, is a real nuisance, a long learning curve, and the TAP, closing the peritoneal flap is a real, is a real challenge. And, and if robotic repair after prostatectomy was so safe, why would there be articles with titles like this? How to navigate it safely. We don't talk about that in open er inguinal hernia repair. Uh, it's safe, we know it's safe. We don't have to convince people that it's safe. Why are we having this debate? Because it's dangerous and we're trying to convince people of the safety of the operation. The, the robotic inguinal hernia curve is long, you know, 30, 30, 35 cases at least, and they add prostatectomy to it, it's probably even longer. Well, what about the Lichtenstein repair? As I said, everyone in the room raised their hand. They know how to do an open Lichtenstein hernia repair. It has a short learning curve. It has good results. It has a lower recurrence rate. It's familiar anatomy. It's low cost. It's a needle and it's a thread, and training is integral to general surgery. You've done a surgery residency, you know how to do a, an a um, Lichtenstein type repair. And doing it in a post prostatectomy field is no more complex um, as a result of the prior, prior operation. Data looking at prostatectomy inguinal hernia repair is highly compelling. MIS repairs without prior prostatectomy versus with double the incidence of, of uh, intraoperative complications. 50% higher post-op complications, reoperation rate from complications significantly higher. Lichtenstein, no difference, no difference, no difference. Those complications haven't improved over time. If we look at the incidents over the past 10 years, the incidence of those complications hasn't changed. We are not better 10 years today than we were 10 years ago. What about those intraoperative complications? Vessel injury, 500% increased rate of complications. Bowel injury, 33% increased rate of complications. Bladder injury, 1,400% increased incidence of complications. You'd have to have your head examined to do it this way. There are sharks in this water. Stay out of the water. There is one Achilles heel. The bottom line is that the post-operative complication rate may be a little bit higher. And finally, payment. Like, why would you do something that's hard, challenging, puts your patient at risk, and get paid less to do it? The RVUs are less. We have two codes for, for laparoscopic robotic inguinal hernia repair. They pay either 436 or 569. You do it open, the, the compensation and reimbursement is significantly better, up to 700 bucks. So we're, we're getting paid less for doing more challenging work that puts our patients at increased risk. So the bottom line is the Lichtenstein repair post-prostatectomy has no added complexity from the prior surgery. The learning curve is straight forward. There's no device learning curve. There's no increased risk of intraoperative major bleeding bowel visceral injury, and it's simply cheaper. So I would argue that less is more. Why not have a happy patient, a happy surgeon, and keep robots out of it? Thank you.